The Digital Equipment Computer Users Society presents this live recording from the 1984 Fall DECUS U.S. Symposium held December 10th through the 14th. We take you to Anaheim, California, where the program is just now beginning. The following material is for informational purposes only and is subject to change without notice. Neither DEC, the author, or DECUS assume any responsibility for the material, its use, or applications. Can we please sit down and come to order so we can get started with the session, please? This is the Rainbow Technical Question and Answer Session, uh, PC SIG session number four. We have here today some members of the Rainbow Group from Digital to answer some of the technical questions that will be coming from the floor. There's a microphone in the front, in the center aisle. Anyone in the audience is perfectly welcome to ask any question they feel like asking. Uh, please come up to the microphone to do it. Uh, as, uh, as was the case in the last session, there was we want to make sure that we observe the non-commercial aspects of, of DECUS. So please refrain from mentioning prices or delivery schedules in your questions. And I'm sure that the deck people will do the same. So with that, I'd like to introduce Katrina Holman from the Rainbow Group, and she'll introduce the rest of the deck people. Good afternoon. I'm Katrina Holman from Rainbow Based Product Marketing. And I picked the easy job today. I just get to introduce all these people, and they get to answer the tough questions. Um, I got a few people still hunting for chairs to bring up here, so I'll start with the people we've got up on the panel. On your right, first person is Wayne Letter. Wayne is in, uh, a supervisor of hardware support in Rainbow Software Engineering, which means he's sort of an expert on diagnostics, firmware, that sort of thing. Did I get that right? Yes, good. Uh, next to Wayne is Richard Smith. Richard is in the Software Applications Product Management Group uh, for Rainbow, and he is a product manager for Lotus 123, uh, Symphony, and Overhead Express. Next person here is Bill Hunter, the Communications Product Manager from Rainbow Product Management Group. Over on my right is Marshall Goldberg, uh, a principal engineer with software engineering. He's uh, an expert on GW Basic and MS-DOS, which probably most of you already know from having been to his earlier sessions. Next to him is Eric Moore uh, from Rainbow Software Product Assurance, uh, principal engineer in that group. He knows a lot about Rainbow Regis. Next to him we have uh, Mary Ellen Hyde, who is in the Rainbow Engineering Support Group. Um, She's a specialist on educational support for applications. Next to her is Bruce Gibson, uh, the lead systems engineer of the Rainbow Engineering Support Group. And over on the end here, who joined us after I started, Neil Rich. Neil is uh, part of Rainbow Based Product Marketing. He's the tactical marketing manager, and he gets to answer all the tough questions to which there are no answers. <laughs> so. <laughs> With that, I will, uh, I finished my job. See, I picked the easy task, and I'll leave these two to any questions you want. The one thing I'd like to ask is that if you have questions, you please come up and use the microphone that's right up here in the front, because otherwise no one in the back can hear. So we'll just open it to questions now. Should I field them? Why should we field them? OK, first question. Dennis Fitzgerald, Computer Sciences Corporation. Um, yeah. Uh, what I hope is a fairly simple question. Is there a way to turn echo off uh, by default so that when you run batch commands, you don't get a, 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 an echo without of an echo off command as the first thing every time? By default. There is a documented patch to command com that I don't have with me, but there is a documented patch to command com. 
uh, and I'll try to put it on one of the FIDO systems uh, for you. But other than that, there's no way. You have to actually patch command comp to change the default to echo off. Thank you. But there is a documented patch, so we'll get it for you. Are there any other questions? <laughs> If I have one that I'd like to ask. On the Rainbow 100A, when you upgrade to a Winchester hard disk, uh, on the B, there's a way that you can boot from the hard disk. And on the A, that choice is not in the uh, initial setup menu. And I was curious what it would take in order to bring it up from the hard disk and have the default be the hard disk. The problem is that the booting code for the Winchester is in the firmware, and in the 100A, there's about 50 bytes of space left in the firmware. In the B, they gave me another 8, 8K, so we had space to do it, but it requires a rewriting of the firmware. Something has to go someplace because there's no room to squeeze the code in. That's why you can't have it on an A. We have another answer that's coming on the board. Those of you who are listening to this on tape won't be able to appreciate it. While this, while this solution is being diagrammed, is there anyone else that has a question that we can have? Or are you, are you ready? OK. We're ready for this one. Okay. You have a, a rainbow A. You must boot on the floppy. If you want the system to never access the floppy again after you boot, put in a config sys file with a command in, the f in that form. The command is shell equals the first parameter indicates what is to be the command shell. In this case, we're going to use command com, which is the default command shell of MS-DOS. The path goes in front of the file name. It, the path can pass to a subdirectory. It can pass, the H is just an example. H colon backslash is just an example. You can pass to any subdirectory you choose. The next parameter tells command com where to pick up the transient portion when it becomes destroyed. And that's very important because that's usually why it has to reaccess the floppy. Once command com knows where to pick up the transient portion and knows that it's on the hard disk, never accesses the floppy again. The slash p tells command com the first time it's executed that it's operating as the top level command shell. You have to have the slash p parameter in there or else when you exit command com to execute your program, the system will crash. But that command line will do it. Put it in config sys. Every time you boot up, the problem will disappear. Okay. To repeat that, that command, for those of you who can't see it, in the config.sys, it's shell equals h colon backslash command dot com space h colon backslash space slash a forward slash p. Marshall, does that uh, config.sys file have to be in the root directory? Yes, it must be in the directory that you're booting on. The sequence of the loading is such that before the command shell is located, is loaded, MS-DOS must get the config.sys file off of the drive that you're booting on. There's no way to change that. So config.sys must be on the floppy that you boot from in order for the shell command to be active. In the current directory? Yes, and this assumes okay. that you have a copy of command com at the root directory of drive H. It can be anywhere. Okay. I'm, I've got one other question. My name is David Palmerston from Helical Products. Um, I've been using CPM very, very rarely, but there are a couple of programs that I've got that run under CPM 80. And um, 
I have had to use a communications program in order to get a couple of programs across, and I've had the problem with getting the error message out of CPM that says no more memory. And it only seems to happen on the programs that I've communicated across the line, um, even though I did use Telelink with CRC enabled. And I wonder if anybody has any other ideas other than you know doing Control-C. I've got 512K, so it should not be a problem. Um, I wonder if anybody has any other ideas as far as you know trying to get around that error message under CPM. Okay, I've I've got a program which um, I know will run on a system that has uh, no more than 384K, uh, which I received via communications uh, using Telelink and CRC communications under CPM. When I execute that program on my system, um, I just get the error message, no more memory. It says no more memory. Yeah. I've got 512K on my system. I've gone through the reboot process. I've started at the very beginning. I've even tried control seeing. Um, and Atlanta wasn't any help so far. I know what it is. I've got to think. It, it, that's a problem that I know about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that one. Uh, yes, my question regards the fact that there are really two processors inside the rainbow. I noticed uh, in the technical book now that there's some memory that's shared between the two of them. What I guess I don't understand is in CPM, CPM says it's 86 slash 80. I don't quite understand, you know, what's the ramifications of the operating system? Is the 8088 always the base operating system and then the loader is sensitive to whether I have a Z80 formatted file or whatever, you know, basically what's going on in the operating system to use this processor? And will MS-DOS ever use it, or is this processor really only there for compatibility with uh, Robins, et cetera? Okay, the uh, uh, operating system is always essentially CPM86. And since it's a superset of CPM80, what happens is the little bit of code that's on the Z80 side packages up CPM80 commands in a form that uh, CPM86 can understand them and passes them over to the other side. The Z80 always has to be there because that is the CPU that controls the floppy disk chip. All right. So even under MS-DOS, it still has to be there because of the way the hardware is designed. Is that sufficient for your answer? Okay. Dennis Fitzgerald from Computer Sciences again. Um, I believe that you people are the source of the backup utilities that are in uh, on CPM and MS-DOS. And is there a way now, or is it coming, that the backup utilities will understand user numbers under CPM and paths under MS-DOS so that you can back up an entire uh, hard disk in one backup call instead of one for every subdirectory? <laughs> The answer to that one is one, one poor word, no. Uh, there was a conscious decision made on that. It wasn't our decision. Uh, in fact, some of the people here wanted to be able to do that, but we were outvoted. Whose decision was it? Higher up. <laughs> 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 is he still in the company? We have another answer. <laughs> For MS-DOS, you can back up the entire disk from the command line. It's something like the format um, backup space slash A. You have two interfaces in backup. One is the sophisticated interface, which tends to want just a subdirectory. But from the command line, you can tell it, do the subdirectory you're in, which could be the root, and everything below. Mm -hmm. That'd be up for DOS. Correct. And the command line on that again was backup space slash A colon to back up the A drive? No, it's for MS-DOS. You have to include a slash A in the command line. Otherwise, it's going to assume you only use the current subdirectory. And that says start where you are in every subdirectory below. You can also use the slash A 
in the sophisticated interface in the MS-DOS backup. Mm -hmm. I solved that problem on CPM by writing a program that changed everything to user zero, remembering what the user number was, and then, then going back at the end. But of course, if you have the same file and different user numbers, that doesn't work. But, uh, uh, my question is, can someone give a, a short lecture on the relocated interrupt vectors and the, the reasons for those and how they work? Okay. Okay. Uh, due to hardware conflicts on the Rainbow 100A, the interrupt vectors for MS-DOS are physically relocated. And there's a software sieve that figures out where, whether the interrupt is actually coming from hardware or software. On the B, they're relocated by the hardware. Now, what this means to the user practical implication of this to the user is if you overlay any MS-DOS interrupt using MS-DOS system services, you must overlay the interrupt through the operating system. If you do that, then the fact that interrupts have been remapped will be completely transparent. If you don't do that, you're headed for disaster for two reasons. Reason number one is vectors are relocated. And reason number two is MS-DOS has a habit of refreshing its own interrupt vectors. If you don't tell it that you've changed an interrupt vector, every time it comes back on, it's going to clean up the, the arena, and it will just refresh the vector. So I hope that helped a little. Does that explain the documentation? I don't think that's really in the documentation. Not to my knowledge. I don't think they really go into the relocated vector problem. But as long as you go through the operating system, all vectors will work as expected. That's the trick. A real quick question back on the backup issue. Does the, the backup under the 2.11 update to MS-DOS list files in volumes other than volume number one? Backup under 2.05 will only list the files in the first volume of the backup set. We don't know? OK. <laughs> the answer is under research. <laughs> I have a 100B, and occasionally I boot up from the hard disk. Occasionally when I run RED, I have all that software on the hard disk. It requires a system diskette in the machine, and occasionally it does not. Uh, once in a while it'll say you need a diskette in. Once in a while it'll go right in and start up RED. I don't understand why it's different from one time to another. And also, uh, is there a way to get around having to keep a system disk get in when you're running Select 86? That's under CPM. Yeah. CPM. You can always ask for it. You need a disk get. A disk get. No, a disk get. A formatted disk get. Do you want to repeat that answer? Uh, or do you want to speak? Yeah, please come to the microphone when you're going to answer or ask questions. I have a 100B also, and I use RED under CPM quite often. I keep a formatted blank diskette in my A drive, and I use RED all the time, and I hear the A drive click on once. But once it's done it the first time, and you're re-editing the same file, it doesn't seem to do it again. Why? 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 Do it? Oh, RED, it RED has, you can't make it stop. You can. Well, if you do red, E colon, and your file name, it will not access the A disk. But, but it doesn't have to be a red disk in A, just any blank formatted disk. Blank formatted disk. Is, is that a bug in red? I mean, it, what happens is when you, if your e, e drive is your default, it's looking on A. That's what it comes down to. It looks on the A drive first. Yeah, I concur with the earlier gentleman. My answer to that problem, I had the same thing. I think it's a problem where file spec does not know enough. If you just say edit and don't give it a device name, it assumes a colon. I think the software was just not written to be flexible like about a lot of other things. It could be fixed, certainly. My solution was to like uh, rename the batch processor to dollar sign or something, and then uh, just say dollar space EDI and make EDI invoke uh, you know, bring the file name that you specify in and it 
pinned an E colon or whatever your default drive is on the front of it, you can kind of hide it from the system. It makes it a little bit nicer, but I think it's a bug. I think it should be fixed in red. Someone, I don't know if you folks have an SPR uh, mechanism like DEC does for its other products, but uh, you know, I think that one should certainly be noted and taken back to DRI, whoever builds these things. I don't know where it came from. That is correct. It's, it really is a bug. It's hardwired in the code to check A drive first. And it, you shouldn't write your software that way, but it, it was written that way, and it's going to go check. So uh, you can get in trouble. But like he says, using a blank, just a blank disk there uh, solves the problem. But it, it shouldn't do that, and it does, and it probably will not, not be fixed. It's, I'm not sure about red, but select I don't think will be. Okay, select it. It accesses the drive every time. In red, it, selects, it accesses it one time only. Is that what you're saying? And then after that, it doesn't do it again. Only because if only if you're doing the same the file. same file. If you're doing another the file, you're going to go back and try to select it again. You know, it, it remembers where your file is after you've done it once. <laughs> Over the years of having rainbows, I've come to the con and and being a VAC system manager, I've come to the conclusion that that putting a hard disk on a rainbow, you're headed for trouble. I hope after a couple more years that the rainbow folks will know how to handle hard disks and will make life a lot easier for those of us who have lived in big systems for many years. For example, backup is a real problem. Uh, this business about programs written to access the floppies, I mean, you're just coming from an old world for a long time. My real question has to do with the differences between the rainbow A and B. Um, oh, I'm Steve Benning from Evans and Sutherland, Salt Lake City. There's a, there's a project or some other term to allow users to take their processor boards into the local DEC business office and buy Rainbow B boards in exchange. I've understood that that was not a national program. Could anybody want to comment on whether that trade-in from A to B is a national program? And if it's going to continue or, you know, short time. Yeah, I've also heard about that program. To the best of my knowledge, it, it's only happening in the Northwest, and it's it's probably an option of the of the local service district uh, that they decided to do that as a service to their particular local group. We have tried periodically to uh, to do that kind of thing on a national basis, and, and we've had some difficulty internally trying to. Uh, establish a program. That is, in fact, the only way you can get all the features of the B is to, is to actually change the motherboard, which is, which is what that program provides for you. So I don't, I don't know what the extent of the program is. I don't know how long it'll last. It's strictly a local option. Uh, any of you that have enough clout with your own service organization could probably get your service organization to provide that kind of service for you. Okay, uh, I've been told that uh, also there's an office in California that does that, too. <laughs> Which one? I heard last week of a computer store um, in the Santa Clara area that is also offering this program. Um, and I don't have the name of the computer store. I can get it if somebody needs it who's in this area. I can get it and give you a call back later in the week um, with the name of the computer store who's doing it. Hi. Uh, my name is Mike Axel. I am from Aerojet Electro Systems. I have something that's not exactly a problem. It was just kind of interesting. When uh, I was formatting some diskettes and for MS-DOS, I, I would format them. Generally, when I get a box of diskettes, I format them all under CPM and put them in my box so they're already formatted. When I use one uh, for MS-DOS, I just put it in and um, occasionally run the format utility on it, and sometimes I don't. But uh, uh, basically what I was doing is I was doing a sys under MS-DOS to copy the, the hidden system files. And it came back and said, not enough system space on disk, but it boots fine and it works fine and I haven't had any trouble with it. It just gives me this message, and, uh, but it seems to work anyway. Uh, any comments? 
What, what it, I mean, it, 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 is it really not done something that, that is going to come back and bite me some other time, but it seems to work fine? Offhand, I'd still recommend you do a format slash S on the diskettes. I'm not sure of why you're getting that message, but it sure sounds fishy to me. Yeah, it looks fishy to me, too. Thank you. He does need more Oh, definitely. Definitely. So maybe you've already formatted them with an earlier uh, operating system so it didn't transfer the new system. Uh, well, they've never been formatted under MS-DOS. But the disk boot after you try to do a SIS? You bet. Put it right out. You're probably missing part of the system. <laughs> I bet you're missing a, a chunk of it. And until you access those services, you'll never know it. It's the old worm theory. You can, that's right. You can bomb, for example, the communications drivers. If no program you're running uses them, you could bomb out all that code and not know it for months. <laughs> Until you have the most important <laughs> demo for the most important customer. <laughs> then it's going to bomb. <laughs> uh, Jeff Miller from CompuServe. I have a couple hardware questions. First one is, uh, are, is DEC planning on any kind of clock upgrade to double the speed of the system? You know, such that a number of other manufacturers have done that, where you can actually just replace the crystal and uh, double the speed of the system. I, I always like to set expectations uh, properly, and I, I would say uh, there's uh, virtually zero probability that we're going to change the clock in the 100 family. Okay, the second question deals with uh, RAM chips. Uh, on the 100B, I noticed you use some variation of a 4164, and I notice there's a little jumper over by the memory array. Uh, is there any plans to go with 256K RAM chips on the 100B board? Other board? Same answer. Zip. Zip. What's that little jumper for? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, third question I have is deals with the uh, high-speed video RAM. In one of the documents that I have, um, it talks about how to set up the system or to uh, either do, I think one of them is an interrupt call or you can just do a clear screen so that basically the system is set up for you now to access the high-speed video RAM. And the thing that I'm curious about is how do I leave that mode gracefully? Okay, the, prob the problem I have is, you know, I do the clear screen and then I can access the, the video RAM, you know, playing with the link lists and, yeah. and all the neat stuff. The problem is when I want to quit doing that and now exit my program and give control back to the operating system, the, p the, p the thing that appears is that about the last ten lines on the screen, um, some for some reason have the scroll bit not set. So they're doing a jump scroll effectively where the top half of the screen is still smooth scrolling. No, I can't. I can't do it. Can't do that. <laughs> I've, 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 I've done it. I, I've had the same thing happen. Use How do you? Use the mic. There's a hidden space. I've hit the exact same situation. How do you get around it? I, I've never been able to get around. The only way I can get around it is to reset the machine. Do you have? Do you have a copy of? Or can you get us a copy of the code you're doing, using to do that? We'd like to see that ourselves. Because <laughs> the smooth scroll, jump scroll is all inside the DC 11 and 12 chips. And all they do is look, look at a bit to determine whether or not they do that, do scrolling at all. Right. The problem is, well, yeah, I don't know how that is getting, you know, munged or whatever. I, I would just like to exit my the, the application gracefully. Um, first of all, I'm talking from the firmware's point of view now. Okay. okay. Uh, from the firmware's point of view, it doesn't care which path you come through. All right. Um, the application that you're using may be bypassing the firmware on the high-speed side. All right. So I'm not familiar with the application to start with. That's the problem. Okay. Well, ba very basically, it's something that I've written. You know, it's not an um, a, an application that I've okay. you're purchased. You're following documentation that tells you how to use the high-speed video. Yes. Yeah. It, under yeah. MS DOS. Yeah. And, and everything. In fact, it tells you how to set it up so that you can use it. 
and I do I follow all the steps and I have no problem the problem is when I want to leave that environment you should be able to just leave it right yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. I I do. I try the clear screen. I try the the screen reset, the escape sequences, and. Well, if the table gets screwed up, you you wind up in a state that you won't be able to restore things. But I think the best idea is to send the code to Bruce. What's <laughs> wrong? <laughs> will, will you sign a non-disclosure agreement if I send you the code? <laughs> It'll be. It'll be included in the next rainbow demo. <laughs> uh, my last question <laughs> deals, uh, would anybody like to speculate on the rumors of an RB f a rainbow 50? <laughs> we, we, we used to internally have a, have a a project called a Rainbow 50. We don't have a project like that anymore. That is, that is not to say that we're not in the process of developing a whole new generation of rainbows, which we actually are. Uh, we really can't go into very much detail at this DECUS. Hopefully by the next DECUS we'll be able to talk in a lot more detail about uh, our future directions. But a message I do want to leave you with is there's definitely a future in the, in the rainbow. Uh, we're going more in the direction of what we like to refer to as the industrial standard, uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, but at the same time, the big dilemma that we have is there are a lot of good things in the current rainbow. We don't want to give those things up. And believe me, it's a hell of a problem to deal with and, and a very difficult knothole to get through. And, and, and hopefully by the next DECUS, we'll have something more definitive we can say. Yeah. Well, I understand the 50 means that it's half as good as a Rainbow 100. If wish list items are appropriate, uh, how about a uh, clock calendar with battery backup so my $7,000 MS DOS system will know as much as my $12 watch? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Brian Higgins. Um, I have programs that copy 8K. Um, when the program starts up, it saves the current screen by copying the 8K of screen memory beginning at segment EE00. And then when they exit, they restore that memory. And it all seems to work fine, but um, occasionally, <laughs> occasionally the repeat key will appear to be stuck on or something when I come out. So apparently the, the keyboard interrupt processor is using some of that memory. So someone could tell me where that memory is so I can avoid copying that, that last little bit of it, hopefully, if it's at the end. I can't tell you exactly where it is because it's split up. Uh, there's a lot more in that 8K of space than just screen memory. The entire firmware, uh, which means a terminal emulation stack, all the variables that the firmware uses, anything that we don't want uh, people in general to be accidentally walking on <laughs> are there. Uh -huh. And you're running into situations where you're saving a state and then restoring it at a later date to a state that's no longer true, and things like repeat keys and such will get screwed up. Well, is there then a better way to save the current screen? Uh, what operating system are you running under? Uh, either one. I do it in both. Okay. Under CPM 8680 version 2, you can uh, use the high-speed performance and save away the entire screen context if you look at the extended uh, BIOS calls that you have available to you there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The same person that authored the AIM-86 CPM emulator that was spoken at at my sessions earlier also has an extended console package for MS-DOS that's available on the FIDO bulletin boards two versions of it, one that stays resident and one that links with other applications. 
and that has an identical interface to the extended console interface that's in CPM version 2. Okay, Dennis Fitzgerald, Computer Sciences. I uh, routinely um, format disks for MS-DOS and don't put a volume label on them. And then I use one of the public domain utilities, uh, particularly one is CV, um, to write the volume name onto there. And MS-DOS has no trouble with that. If I say vol under MS-DOS, it says whatever I said. If I do a dir under MS-DOS, it says what I said. But when I use some of the public domain uh, software that goes through and, and um, looks at the, that and, and tells me what and, and gets the volume ID from it. It doesn't seem to recognize it, though. If I do, if I put the um, if I put the name in with a format with the format command, it does recognize it. What is um, CV not doing that the format command does do? And you know. That kind of thing, you know. I don't, I don't understand why it shouldn't work. I've looked at the attribute bits and they look right and all this, but it, it still doesn't find it in these other programs. I've used CV. I haven't really had much trouble with it, but I'll investigate the problem for you, for sure. CV is just a, an unsupported hack. I don't know who wrote it, but it's in the public domain and drifts around. I've used it from time to time, but it's. Uh, Definitely, you're treading dangerous waters. There's some assumptions that are done in CV. I've looked at the code that look a little stark, so I'm a little afraid of it <laughs> myself. <laughs> I forget, there was one thing in particular that, that scared me about it, some assumption about memory location that may not be true, but I'll take a peek at it. Archie Prince, Budget Rent Car Corporation, Chicago. I've got two questions. Uh, when you install your hard disk drive, and as it comes with a power supply that has a wire that doesn't go anywhere. It has a wire, when you install your Winchester upgrade, the power supply has a wire that doesn't go anywhere. Could you tell me the reason for that? And the second question is that if you have a red file created under 1.0 version, 2.0 won't read it. Uh, if you come out with another version of CPM, you mean that CPM won't read my 2.0 files? I can answer question number one. The plug is for a DC fan that's used in the B. And it's not necessary on the A because the A has an AC fan. Question number two I can't answer. Okay, uh, red files created under 1.0. Uh, if you're running 2.0, you can't read those or you can't, you, you can't find those files. Is there a reason for that? I'd question your disk. You can. We do it all the time. You may have a, uh, can you read anything on that disk? Well, if you're running, running 2.0 and you put in a red disk that has a file that's been created under 1.0, I've been having trouble uh, calling up those files. Can you, but can you, it, that, it, it's not red. Red does read one, you can cross between the versions with no problem whatsoever. Can you read anything on that disk that those files are on? No. And you're saying it's a bad disk? It's probably, a, yeah. Or you're having a compatibility problem between those disks. Were they written on the same machine? Yeah. At a later, at an earlier, later date, long time. Earlier, long, long time. You ago. may have a, a your drive may be going out of the line. <laughs> Take a shot, Dave. Take a shot. <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> That, that disk, you could have, it also could have been near magnetism or anything like that. You could have corrupted the disk itself, but I would be more susceptible to disk alignment problem. Yes, the easy question is, uh, can you boot version 1 and run red there with that disk? I mean, is the disk readable, bootable, whatever? Maybe it doesn't have a version 1 disk anymore. Um, <coughs> let's see. My question is... Uh, uh, my parents, you know, they're 70, 80 years old, and they got themselves a rainbow and just love it. And I, <laughs> and they write the family letters to us all over the world, and you know, just just terrific. I, I'm I'm the resident expert. Have to bail them out whenever, and I need to advise them whether or not they should learn CPM or MS DOS 
and or when is MS-DOS going to come bundled with a screen editor? Now maybe that's been answered in earlier sessions. Screen editor for MS-DOS? And, um, oh, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't want Bruce to answer this one. I want to answer this one. <laughs> no, basically, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think the basic problem is that uh, Microsoft, uh, when they include a screen editor, in their standard release for 3.0, 4.0, whatever it is that we make as the next upgrade for our operating systems, when they include a screen editor with their software, we will include a screen editor with our. We, we did a lot of things in CPM uh, with and without the help of DRI. Uh, we made a policy decision not necessarily to do the same things with Microsoft for a whole bunch of, of reasons, uh, good and bad. But that's, that's the basic answer. Thank you. I had the same question. I was just wondering how CPM had an editor called Ed. Maybe at MS-DOS you get an editor called Redline or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been f I've been fooling around with Symphony for the past month, and I think it's really neat. But one of the requirements or on the thing is that you have 320K of memory. Is that going to be true on the rainbow also? I know it. it it really needs a lot of memory to do all those neat little goodies, but if I've got a 100A, can I use Symphony? Well, the good news is that you can use Symphony, but the, um, the bad news is you do need 320 KB, and that's um, a requirement for the basic Symphony program. Lotus just couldn't get 10 pounds in the 5-pound bag. I, I understand that, but... So there's another board out there that can get me more than 256 that I don't oh, know yes. about? I think that's a hardware question. And what there's happens? An adapter board for the I already board. have a board that has, you know, the 196. So I lost it, huh? <laughs> or 190, whatever it is, 192. The, the question is, what happens to the memory that you already bought for your A if you want to use the adapter? <laughs> I, think we find I think we ought to let Neil answer is that one. <laughs> is there going to be another board? There is. There is. Yeah. There is. Un unfortunately, when you upgrade an A with more memory, if you have already have a 192 KB board, that board has soldered in chips, 64 K banks. The B, uh, so you can't do anything with it. It's 192, period. Uh, if you got the one that had 64K, you could solder in some chips, but you could still only solder in 64K chips. The B board is set up so you can use 64K chips or 256K chips, bank per bank. It's three banks, and you can intermix to get any, any multitude. With the new uh, memory expander board, you have, it'll allow you to use B memory in an A to bring it up to, to 832K. Uh, there's a 64K difference from the A and the B because it's 64K more on the B motherboard. So you can get a total of 832K on the B, but because you have to use, I mean, on the, on the A and 896 on the B, but because you have this 192K board, you wouldn't... I lose. It, it, you lose. <laughs> the okay. only thing to do is find, maybe find somebody that... Uh, I know on that you can plug that A board into it, <laughs> but to upgrade a, upgrade an A, you need a B mo a, a B memory board and the upgrade kit. Okay. So the, the A board's gone. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want an A board? Here's a guy that got one. That has one. He, he can't tell you prices or availability though. <laughs> Uh, does that mean that my uh, A memory board uh, runs on my B motherboard? That 192 A board plugs in. Yes. The answer to that. With the adapter. <laughs> there, there is something. Um, I hope I don't get booed too much. I happen to believe there's a place for every rainbow, and it's not in 
Well, it, it's in uh, it's in each of our homes, but I, I I'm from a company that has a lot of them in our offices, and they have big discs, and we need to have those big discs backed up in a reasonable manner. And we have we have a data PBX serving our office, and we have 15 vaxes, and we have large disc farms, and we we're trying to get a. a a vision on what way to approach uh, doing a backup on these on these 10 megabyte disks. <laughs> Have I got a product for you? Oh. Uh, if you'll stop by the booth, is, is there zero chance of having it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> substantially greater than zero chance of having. It. Actually, if you stop by the booth, we're demonstrating an unannounced product called the Rainbow Office Workstation which will be out sometime later this year. Our backup strategy, one of, one of the pieces of uh, functionality that goes with that Rainbow Office workstation is, a, is an unattended backup feature. In other words, you set the time of the day anytime you want. It's a smart backup utility. It will automatically log into whichever VAX you choose or whatever system you choose over whatever circuitous, circuitous route you create for it, uh, you know, whatever uh, whatever communication setup you have over a modem, over hard lines, through networks, whatever, because it's all scripted communications files, and it will do a smart backup of your Winchester for you into VAX files. By smart backup, it will only back up the most, it will only back up the files that have changed since the last backup, and it will back them up by file name so that you can do a selective restore. While you sleep, if you if you choose to do it that way, now that's that will solve your problem. We do understand those people that don't want to buy a Vax as their backup device. And, and for those people, the best I can do is tell you that we are aware of some third-party devices that use the RS-232 port. We're trying to get some of them in-house to evaluate them. Uh, if, if they turn out to be fairly reasonable, we'll make sure our sales force is aware of them. Unfortunately, we don't have any plans right now to do an, an internal integral uh, backup product for the Winchester. Uh, I wish I could remember them. I, I just don't remember them off the top of my head. But there, there are two, uh, two or three of them that do use RS-232. If you buy a copy of, uh, of Mumble Mumble World or, or something like that, uh, you'll, you'll probably run across those. My name is Dave Goodowitz from Microsystems Engineering. Uh, I'd like to take a poll of the audience, if you don't mind, and then I'd like to ask at least one question. Uh, the poll would be, uh, how many people here would appreciate or like a full screen editor for uh, MS DOS on the rainbow? Okay, I, I would say that's uh, at least 90% of the audience. Now, my comment and question would be uh, we are the digital rainbow users bunch, more or less, and we're assembled here to ask questions and hopefully get some answers. So if 90 some odd percent of a uh, interested group is interested in a product, can you now take that and put it on some kind of menu system or wish list or what have you and, you know, do something with that? Now, I, I'd like to suggest that maybe... Yeah. You said a full screen editor. Did you mean you want... With DOS. Oh, you want a text editor bundled with DOS? Yeah. Uh, well, okay. How many how many people would be willing to buy another copy of the operating system to get a full screen text editor bundled with DOS? Because that's really the question. Sure. Fine. Okay. Now, does the PC SIG have a menu item or a wish list? Is anybody here from the PC SIG? Yes. They do. Okay. Is that a published list of uh, top ten items or whatever it is? Uh, it can be. It can be. Really? I suggest okay. you go to the PC uh, suite. Talk to the PC people. I think Fine. Uh, I, okay. Thank you. I have a partial reply to that. Can you come to the microphone, please? <laughs> B 
Bill Patterson, Madison, Wisconsin Local Users Group. That AME 86 public domain product that was written by a DEC employee from Switzerland, I believe? Geneva. Geneva, okay. That, one of the, one of the programs, it, it essentially lets you run CPM 86 programs, a great majority of them, under MS-DOS. Where, where can we get this? It's a public domain program. Uh, several pages back on that clipboard, there are a couple numbers you can call. It's also submitted to the RSX and VAX VMS SIG tapes by the Madison, Wisconsin Local Users Group. One of the programs that does work on there is RED. You can run RED under MS-DOS. Other things, TK Solver, I guess MBASIC and things like that. Okay, my name is Bob Carr. I'm from Southern Connecticut State University. We've got 500 rainbows in one location. And my question is very simply, sorry. <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> Anyways, uh, on the upgrade from the B memory board on an A board, just by changing over to the whatever it is module you supply and the B memory board, are there anything we're is there anything we're going to lose between the A board and the B board other than the other 64K? Who cares? There's no interest on that either. If I read your question right, you're wondering if there's any trade-offs besides... Are we losing anything? Z nothing. Nothing, except the, the, except the Winchester option when it pops up. Uh, sorry. No, it's, it's just the Winchester you're not even losing a, You're not even losing a slot. The memory upgrade board plugs in where your memory expansion goes. Then the B memory board plugs on top of that piggyback. Okay. There's just enough room, believe me. So it, it just fits in tight. We can go up to 832K instead of 896K. Yes. Thank you. You lose nothing else. Hi, Russ Wernberg with Sandia National Labs. With regards to the Rainbow Office Workstation backup, at what rate does that run? Is it stuck to 9600 or can we go? Yeah, up to how high? Can we run 19.2 with that? We're, we're going to be backing to 11. Yeah, if you're, if you're hardwired and you can run at 18.2, it'll, it'll run at 18.2. It's basically over the communication lines. Uh, if and when we have uh, Ethernet or DECnet products, uh, you can run at those speeds. But it's, it's basically a communications limited backup uh, uh, restore utility. All right. Okay. And one more quick question. With Overhead Express, Will that run with the LPO3? Can we just dump? We were running it today. Okay. Well, I, I talked to someone over at the LPO3, and they were saying, don't run Overhead Express. Just uh, buy the RAM with, so they have the larger fonts, but we don't want to do that. The, the question was, um, is Overhead Express, which also is an unannounced product. Wow. <laughs> The question was, um, would Overhead Express, which is an unannounced product for the Rainbow, run with the LNO3 um, laser printer? And the answer is, yes, it'll work with it, but Overhead Express output is a graphic format. And the issue on the LNO3 is you have to have enough memory in the LNO3 to accept all the graphic data that, L that the Overhead Express sends to the LNO3. And you can overload the memory, in which case the the page won't come out. So it's a trade-off. You may need you ha you definitely need more memory on the LNO3 to run graphic output, and even in that case, um, it may get overloaded with some of the if you have a m very involved slide. Unlike the LA50, was with a buffer. The LNO3 has to take the whole page, all the information for one page, in before it does the page. And that's, what, that's why the little old LA50 with just a couple of K buffer can handle it, because it sits and chugs along. Well, the LN LNO3, and, or all the laser printers, take a page at a time before they do any output. Bob Havlin with uh, Swerdup in uh, St. Louis. Uh, I'd like to get your comments on a problem that we've run into. Uh, we're a shop that has both A's and B's. And what, what we found out is that programs that were developed under version 2.01 of DOS um, running on an A unit or a B unit will work fine. But when they run under 2.05 on the A units, uh, they give that nice little interrupts off error and, 
and it just don't work. Uh, I was wondering if that's been fixed with this 2.11 upgrade, and uh, get your comments on why that doesn't work. Uh, usually that comes from taking over MS-DOS interrupts. In version 205, there were some known bugs in taking over cr certain critical MS-DOS interrupts. Wasn't the Control-C interrupt one of them? It was yes, it's fixed in 211. So I can run it 211? It is fixed, yes. On the if you have trouble, let us know, but that should be fixed. There were uh -huh. definitely problems in overlaying system interrupts regardless of how you did it, and that's been fixed. Right, same problem. If you modify interrupts, always do it, in, uh, interrupt entries, always do it through the operating system. That's a potential source of problem. Dave Goodowitz, Microsystems Engineering. Uh, the print screen uh, button works very nice when you're using your rainbow as a terminal. Uh, how about in other than using it as a terminal? I know it doesn't. I mean, is somebody, is somebody given any thought to that? I think it'd be a nice little feature. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> In GW Basic, there's an L copy command that will print the screen. Uh, I, I meant to push the one button and bingo. Yep, right. Real language. What if you're not running GW? Real language. <laughs> <laughs> I fixed that, man. <laughs> I mean, from the, oper <laughs> from the operating system level, not from a language. Um, in a recent issue of one of the DEC-related magazines um, that is oriented towards DEC micros in particular, they uh, had two things. One is there was an, an announcement, uh, a, an article that told how to write it yourself, um, how, to, how to interpret what's in the screen RAM so you can do it, implement it yourself. I also saw, I think in the, in the local users group, um, newsletter for the, group, the Washington, D.C. Rainbow Users Group, there is a company that, that sells a product which runs under both CPM and MS-DOS, which goes in and essentially patches the operating system and gives you the print screen function all the time. Uh, there are quite a few applications, too, that also uh, implement the print uh, screen key. Uh, there are a couple even from DEC, including the Regis uh, emulation package that does implement the print screen key and uh, even takes the graphics uh, right off the, uh, the screen exactly the way they are. So it's an, a it's an application issue. We haven't patched the operating system. So th is there any uh, thought of doing that or, or not? I'll, I'll certainly bring the message back. Thank you. The one thing people get confused on, too, is that print screen key just just puts out an ASCII sequence like any other key. It's up to you. It's, it's got a function. It's like uh, any of the other function keys you have to utilize. You have to design an application or a driver to make that key work. It like doesn't work. Excuse me? Like setup key? Yeah. Well, setup key is, is done in, in the hardware. And set, 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 up is firm, set, up, set up is a different key. Set up is a firmware. Well, I'll right. Print screen is right next to it. Yeah, but just because it's right next to it on the keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you put the label on it. There's keys below it that are right next to it, too, and they just put out an ASCII sequence. <laughs> Location doesn't mean anything. It's a function key only. It produces an ASCII sequence. Yeah, but you put the name print screen on it. I, I agree with that. Nice but it, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's, we, it was there, and there's other keys that don't work as the quite as advertised, too. The documentation that, that first came out show the escape sequence for the print screen. Could not find it. And all the rest of them. No, it, it showed. At, at started out on like F4. Come up and say the one. What is it? The one the reason the documentation didn't say so, uh, because on an A, it didn't come out with an escape sequence. It was only available as a level 2 16-bit uh, keyboard function, one of the extended functions. It was only on the B when I got extended to the point where it would send out an escape sequence to a normal, uh, what we call level 1 or ASCII uh, application. So if you have a 100A, you can't use the print screen in a micro base? You can, provided you get the key through what's called a level 2 interface, through an extended function. Yeah. 
I just want to interject something. Um, it's nice that we have such spirit of interplay between the, the members of the DECAS and the people that DEC has graciously sent out here to uh, speak to us, but I've kind of noticed that it's getting a little bit on the badgering side, and I'd like to calm it down a little bit, please. The print screen thing was a badger? Is that your? Some of the comments from the audience I felt were getting okay. a lot of hand. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody also asked, what is that phone number up there? So I'll just pass that on. Okay. The phone numbers that are listed up here are some phone numbers for some local bulletin boards. Uh, that local? If you live in the 617 area, if you live in the 619 area, they're local. <laughs> <laughs> there are some other local, there are some in the Los Angeles area, we're not the total desert. But the, uh, this, this is one of the, this is the prime, one of the prime methods of getting public domain software at a, just whenever you want it, just dial one up and, and, uh, and, it, and it's there for your taking. Uh, there, there's going to be a uh, Birds of a Feather session scheduled for tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, I think it starts, uh, dealing with one of the popular bulletin board services that runs primarily on the, on the Rainbow Deck Micros. And for those of you who are local, I know at least one phone number for a local node on this particular network. It's 213-204-2996. To repeat, that's 213-204-2996. Okay, Bob Carr from Southern Connecticut State University. We, the earlier session, they said the 211 took care of some of the RX-50 disk drive problems. Okay, on the MS-DOS side, hopefully, since we're all having marvelous little things called seek errors and unknown horror shows, what about the CPM side? Any hope, or are we going to just go in and keep replacing disk drives? We've finally convinced through pain and other things, uh, the powers to be, that we will, we will be doing a, an H-Kit 211 type uh, product for CPM, just like we did for MS-DOS. Uh, available, uh, availability and date, I'm not sure, but we've finally got the okay that, yeah, it does have to be done, and the driver is the same for both MS-DOS and CPM for the RX-50, so the new driver will be in CPM. This will hopefully take care of these most of these problems? Allah, please, yes. <laughs> okay, for those who don't know, the H-Kit, uh, you can buy 211, documentation really should because he knows, but you can buy 211 uh, as a, as a full-blown system, as a new operating system, and you can also, we're also offering it as an H-Kit, as a, as a patch, as an upgrade, to upgrade existing 205 up to 211, and it's a lot cheaper, so that you don't have to buy the whole thing over again. While in uh, Ricky Leopoulos Naval Ocean Systems Center, uh, from the Cincinnati DECAS, I received uh, a neat little utility diskette, and one of the utilities was TYP. When you run that in the 132 column mode, it completely blows your rainbow out. <laughs> Is there a patch for that? You, the screen goes completely wacko. I don't know. I haven't and tried. And you have to reboot. That's one of the ones I sent you. Right. I didn't post my. I, didn't have that. I knew. I knew that was coming. Just for the. How many people here had received the disc that I sent? Thank you. At least it's. Uh, I'm glad that some some did because I sent out. Less suckered me into it, and I ended up doing the work. And it was. But as you know, the ones that got it about 200 pages and two discettes, and it was done at night for a lot of nights. But it was. It was all free, and that's, that's just. That's just part of the standard service. It was, it, was, it ain't going to be done this time. <laughs> it, <laughs> no, I, I don't take business cards this time. It was, it was all public domain. We had nothing to do with, well, some of the guys in the group wrote some of the stuff, but it was all public domain, and that's why I stamped it public domain, and it's unsupported. And, uh, but send questions, and I'll see if I can find the answers like that one. Because uh, to my knowledge, everything, that, when they put them on the disc, everything worked. What happened between between my office and, uh, or between the original disc to my office and Uncle Sam's mail route, I don't know. So you, you could very well have legitimate problems. Has anybody else run into problem with uh, type? Has anybody else used type? Did it, did it work? Okay. I'll, I will try it when I get back and to see if maybe the master's gone or if it never did work, but to our knowledge it did. 
Uh, I'll spend a little time on it. Uh, Brian Higgins, DHP Associates. Um, the documentation seems to imply that the um, compose key will be returned uh, with a level one console in, but uh, never seem to get past the, uh, the interrupt routine or whatever it is that's handling the compose key. Am I just missing something in the documentation? This is another difference between the A and the B. On the A, the compose key only gave you that uh, code that you were looking for. Now this on is the, a 100 plus. On the plus, well, okay, B and plus are the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, plus just means you got a hard disk with it. Um, on the plus or the B, the um, firmware does the compose for you. It's actually in the code, and that's why you never see it outside like you used to on the A. I'd like to say, as an English-speaking person, that I find the Compose key a real nuisance, especially where it's placed on the keyboard. <laughs> I hear it all the time, too. <laughs> Randy Coley from Evanston Sutherland. Uh, now that VMS understands uh, VT220 terminals, it's frustrating having the keyboard there. It looks like a VT220 keyboard and not having the firmware terminal emulator in VT220 format. Is it possible to get rid of some of those foreign character sets and replace the ROM? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll save Wayne a trip. Uh, uh, the same problem that we had on the A running out of firmware space, we've also got on the B. Somehow we have this tendency to use up all the, all the firmware space. So the only, the only way that, that Wayne's group could really handle that problem would be to completely re-architect uh, the firmware, and we have no plans to do that right now. That's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that uh, since all those character sequences are there, uh, you can, with software, uh, create a terminal emulator that uh, uh, will, in fact, uh, give you as close to 220 or as close to 240, 241 emulation as we can get with the Rainbow architecture and the Regis product that we've got. And in fact, uh, we have such a terminal emulator uh, that ships with that Rainbow Office workstation program that I've talked about. Polycoms does unfortunately trap a lot of those characters, so you get uh, an emulation that's somewhere halfway between a, uh, a 100 family product and a 200 family product. Uh, so the bottom line is firmware no, software yes. Is the software a lot s slower than what the firmware would be? No, no. Uh, would it be possible to, oh, Dave Feast, Lawrence Livermore La National Laboratory, uh, would it be possible to get some sort of learn key implementation for the uh, unused special function keys at command level, in either CPM or ms -DOS, something that would attach to the operating system that would allow you to permanently redefine those keys for or programmable function keys, basically? Because they're useless otherwise, uh, unless you have an application that uses that particular escape sequence. Yeah, one of the, why I wanted it on the operating system is we have one that installs in one version of the operating system and in another version causes it to eat itself alive. If it was really part of the system, then we wouldn't have to deal with third-party software trying to attach itself to CPM 8680 in ways that CPM 8680 doesn't appreciate. So it's a wish list item. That's a wish list item, yes. Dennis Fitzgerald, Computer Sciences. <coughs> uh, after that comment on the TYP program, I was reminded of a problem I've had with the corresponding program under MS-DOS, VIEW. Um, if you get a file larger than a certain size, I'm not sure, I think maybe it's 32K, it might be some other size, um, VIEW will <coughs> die. Apparently it loads stuff into memory, and when it runs out of memory, it dies. That wouldn't be too bad. It's annoying, but it's not too bad. But when it dies, it takes the cursor with it. Is there, <laughs> is there any way to turn the, is there a simple way to turn the cursor back on after it's been um, turned off and, and left off? It's very disconcerting, by the way, to uh, sit there with your rainbow and type away, and you say, what's wrong? You know, I know what, there's no cursor. <laughs> and it, it's very strange. 
So anyway, is, is there a simple way to get that cursor turned back on? No. Because <laughs> uh, in developing GW Basic, of course, we hit many error conditions, and one of those error conditions would be left with no cursor. And uh, all the king's horses and all the king's men, the cursor would not come back again. <laughs> it was just a reset city all the way. <laughs> That, that's been my experience so far. <laughs> How about yeah. whoever wrote... Somewhere they're very sensitive, and it doesn't, it's just not practical. You'd think that a simple reset, software reset, would restore order to the house, but it doesn't. Um, I don't know who wrote View, but if, there, if it was somebody who is in listening, or if the people listening know, um, could you pass that back as a, uh, a fix so that it, if it does bomb because it ran out of memory to not take the cursor with it in a uh, future? One thing it brings up for programmers about the cursor when a lot of people want to disable the cursor uh, and kind of remove it for their program so they can create their own cursor. Uh, one abnormality we found in DOS is uh, if you should accidentally somehow in your program, while you're in the process of building your program and designing your program when you're debugging and stuff, turn the cursor off four times, you're going to turn it, it, only the first time is going to take it away. The next three times are going to sit there in the stack though, and when you try to turn it back on, you're going to have to turn it back on four times. It remembers how many times it goes off, even though it only acts upon the first one. But on the coming, <laughs> coming back out, it doesn't act upon the first one, it acts upon the last one. So uh, if you start playing that game and it never comes back on, tell it to come back on again and until it does, and it will. It remembers how many times you've accidentally <coughs> told it to go off. The, uh, the cursor, the reason that it uh, keeps track of how many times you turn it off, in the firmware there are multiple reasons for turning off the cursor, and because they can be nested, we decided to nest the count. And exactly what he says, you turn it off three times, you've got to tell it to turn on three times before it comes back, because we keep a count of how many times it's been disabled and how many times you've re-enabled it before it actually comes back. So if you're playing that game, you, uh, the documentation spells that out as well. It tells you that. You have to watch that one. Doug Brantley, Cerritos College. Uh, I have a bunch of questions. First, um, you can, in the setup mode, you can change from a block cursor to an underlined cursor. Now, that's not a displayed underline. If you display a line of blanks, it doesn't show underlines. It, when you bring up the cursor, it's just an underline instead of a block. Is there an escape sequence to change that setup format from an applications program to go from a, a block cursor to just a blinking underline cursor? Is there a VT100 escape sequence? If there is, it's there. I can't yeah, I can't find one. And if it's not documented, Okay, good. That's a good answer. And, um... Excuse me, doesn't GW Basic do that? GW Basic... Microphone. Microphone. Okay. GW Basic has its own overlay driver. It overlays the firmware. And you can change the default cursor in GW Basic to even a combination of underline and block, which is interesting to watch. Very <laughs> simple. <laughs> okay, thanks. With the locate statement. The locate statement controls the position of the cursor and the cursor type that's displayed, if displayed. If uh, anybody's ever dialed into FidelNet, they've probably seen my name on a lot of the FidelNet nodes. I'm the person who has a 100A that keeps on blowing up because of a hard disk controller board. DEC has been real good about this. They pulled my uh, rainbow in after warranty was up, and they've replaced the motherboard three times now, the controller board, Th twice or three times, I think twice. Don't get it right yet. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, uh, somebody in, in Deck Atlanta told me that uh, there was a bad cable that was delivered with a lot of the 5 meg drives. I have a 5 meg running on a 100A, and um, I suggested that my service person in Costa Mesa call back to Deck Atlanta. They said, sure, that was the problem. They replaced the cable. The um, the problem with the 5 meg drive is that I turn it on, I boot MS-DOS from drive A, and it gives me the message, warning, hard disk is not formatted or not partitioned. This is my, it does not destroy the data. Everything's still there, and I can get back at it if, the, if I boot again after repeated times or the machine decides to. It's very strange. It's as if the machine gets lonely. If I don't use it constantly, <laughs> this, this message comes back up. 
That's human engineering. We make them. We have a personality. <laughs> but there's there's more to it. It's it's blown. Okay, now it's blown. It's blown the motherboard, and this only started. I had a perfect rainbow until I put in this five meg upgrade. Okay, I never had any problems with the machine for a year and a half. I I upgraded the power supply that came with the upgrade kit to the 100B power supply. There there was there's two problems, uh, and they could be commingled in your case. One was uh, there weren't there wasn't any bad cables that were sent out. There was some bad drives from Seagate that we have gone out with track 385 bad, which is tells it what it is. What to, it tells the operating system what that drive is. Seagate actually formats that track to, with the information that we need. And if it's not there, the controller gets real sick. The other problem was is the old cables didn't have spaces. If you have a cable that has a very large head on the controller side, that's how you tell the difference from the old one and the new one. The new one's a very thin a lot thinner, and you've got some room to get your fingers in there. Uh, the old ones ha had no spacer on the disk drive side, and they were, it was a little bit sloppy, and you could off-center the pins. And break the pins. No, no, no not on that end, on the, on, the, on the drive end now. The old cable, which had the large, large head on the controller end, that was the old cable. On the, on the Winchester drive end of the cable, not the controller end, the end with the two, ca two cables where it splits into two, has no pins in there, there's a spacer pin, Didn't, the, no keyways. They weren't in there and it allowed slop. Just moving the system around could knock your winnie out. That, I think you that's could, the you key. Could, you, could, you could bump it and it would pop yeah, out. Because it, when I take it to deck service, they, they test it out. It, it and tell you you're nuts because it works. And yeah, it, it works fine. It, yeah. I take it home I and I put it in a vertical in floor stand. <laughs> I put it in a, floor, a vertical floor stand and boom, it goes bad. Yeah. You, uh, you're probably having a cable problem. Okay. You've that's been, you've that's replaced everything else. And they no, know the cable's been, been replaced. Okay. Probably with the same old it's one. No, it's a brand new, it's a brand new cable. It's the smaller head, smaller head. at the controller connection. And it, it's not still not working. And now the machine is going black after 15 minutes of use. <laughs> Just goes black, but if you tear it down, you blow off the, the cards, you blow the dust off the cards, you tear it all down, you put it back together, the thing works fine. Uh, uh. You've got me. I, 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 don't, I don't know. QA, QA might want to talk to me about a job. David Palmerson from Helical Products. I had a question about the technical character set. I don't know whether there's anybody here that's familiar with it, but the, the documentation uh, that I've seen on it says that it m replaces the multinational character set, um, and I understand that. Well, my question is, what happens to the compose key, and actually, how do you uh, utilize the technical character set? Yeah. The technical character set option contains both the character generator ROM change and uh, motherboard firmware ROM changes. Um, the firmware ROM changes are required to add the escape sequence parsing that allowed you to select the alternate ROM and alternate ROM special graphics characters from uh, a normal ASCII type application. The characters themselves, the pixel patterns, replace those of the uh, deck multinational characters. And you can now access those through either the normal 8-bit uh, path or with the escape sequences to select a character set and then invoke the appropriate character set. Um, you can have your say on this. <laughs> okay. Um, what was the other question? Uh, what happens with the compose key? Well, the, the compose key still functions. It generates a 8-bit code that gets interpreted as is appropriate with the pixel pattern for uh, whatever that matches in the technical character set. So it, it still will compose things, uh, but what you'll see on the screen as a result of the compose will be a technical character set. I think the documentation has a map that shows you what that is. I got a copy of the documentation here if you'd like to see it. Uh, I know the uh, new, newer Microvaxes and I believe the Pro has now got a 32 or 33 byte Winchester on it. Is there any plans to bring that to the rainbow? Megabyte. 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 I'm sorry, I don't know what I said. I meant megabyte. <laughs> 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 That's, that's the RD52, and yes, we've had a lot of requests for that. Uh, we're trying to generate enough of uh, 
uh, enough of a business model that, that uh, we can uh, go to our upper management and say, hey, our customer base absolutely has to have this product. Let me just see a show of hands. How many people would like to see that 33 megabyte upgrade? How many people would not like to see the 33 megabyte? Okay, fine. Thank you. Would not? More space is usually better, but no, I haven't seen you manage the existing space yet. Uh, but you will, so there's no reason to lag too far behind. Um, I have a uh, Rainbow 100A with 256K bytes of memory, that is the 64 plus the 192 expansion board, and I'm running CPM, uh, CPM2 something, uh, I'm running red, and on my screen after editing for a while, three or four hours, I notice that I've got a scrolling region at the bottom of my screen, like line, line 17 is, is, uh, is, folding in or scrolling under 16 and so I, I type a new line and and I'm, I'm down typing on a line 23 and line 17 is is getting scrolled up underneath 16 um, but I can type that way forever it will keep scrolling I, I can exit red and 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 shut down the power on my machine and reboot and it'll go away for a couple of hours generally it'll happen every day um, hints on uh, where anybody would rec recommend a fix Motherboard, firmware. <laughs> Doesn't seem like anybody else has had the problem. Yeah, I've had the problem. I've seen it. Yep. You get a scrolling region at the bottom. You get a scrolling region at, exactly, and the top 16 lines of your whatever editing stay there, and you got to work in three or four lines, and it's not always easy. <laughs> there's an escape sequence. There's an escape sequence in the VT100 programmer's reference card. It's escape bracket one semicolon 24 lowercase r that'll clear it off for you. It's a scrolling region. Yeah, but if you you're, what, you can't do that while you're in the middle of editing. Oh. Did you see it? In, did you see it in red? Or? Yes, that's where I've seen it in red. Only in red. I've seen it. I've not been able to see it in anything but red. Yes. Right. I've seen the same thing in red or select, I'm not sure which, but it seems to me that it goes away when I hit a next screen or anything that hops to a different part of the file. So it's annoyance, but it's something you can get rid of. Have you been running a couple of utilities like disk copy or something before red? No. No. Okay, because what I was wondering is, in um, some cases we've not entirely cleaned up after utilities. And I was wondering if this could have occurred with red. No, it's something that occurs in the, maybe after you're editing for a half hour, an hour, or maybe even after 10 minutes. It's not when red comes up that it's that way. It will just happen. And then, like, the uh, next screen will clear it, and maybe 10 minutes later it will happen again. Maybe it won't happen during the whole day. Had it's very been, erratic. Had you been doing any very large appends? No appends. Uh, I really uh, I don't keep a diary of what I do. I really don't know offhand. Not that I think. Not that I think, really think. Well, if you can find a, a sequence that creates a problem, let us know so we can solve it. Just use it. <laughs> I never I have another rainbow A. I, I, I have four of them. I, I mean, my mom has one, dad has one, you know. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and my older sister has one. It's my older sister who's got it. Mine at home, it doesn't have a problem. So, um, and judging from the, how many A's do we have in, in the? How many people have ever have encountered a problem scrolling like that? I don't care, you know, any type of scrolling where you couldn't get out of a scroll type thing. See. It's, it's something we really didn't know about, and we're kind of glad to hear about it because we will start to investigate it. Uh, and this, sometimes this is the only way we find out it's through these type of forums. I, I find lots of problems because I get about 50 to 100 calls a day, and they're mostly irate, but... 
because they want to know how to program something. But I have, and so I know I usually keep everybody up to date from some of the weird things that happen because the, the ISVs are hitting them, and I haven't seen that one. This is this is why it is kind of amazing to me that I haven't seen it. So uh, we will do some checking on it. Do you want any contact from those of us who have the problem? No, like, like he said, I will we'll sit down and fire it up and make I it do it. A yeah, I, I got a couple of secretaries. I can slip in a red disc and. Yes. Uh, yes, large files. Do you see it ever? Do you see it ever on small files? I have a feeling it's always on large. No, I've never seen it on a small file. Okay, that's a good clue. Thank uh, you very much. Like like 50, 50 pages, I say large file. Well, I've seen it. I've seen it on yeah. ten and fifteen pages. I've, I haven't gotten that long. Good. Can I give my secretary fifty pages at one time? <laughs> I'll be in trouble. We, thank you. We will check on it though. Uh, my name is John Tarzi, and I have a uh, 100 uh, plus, and running the uh, demo on the graphics package on a uh, Barco uh, monitor, I get a rolling effect constantly, and when I switch to the, uh, the regular deck uh, monitor, color monitor, she holds pretty step. I was wondering if there's a problem with that, or if anybody has heard anything about that. Uh, r you know, running graphics on a Barco monitor, color monitor, yeah. I get a rolling effect when I use the uh, demo package using the uh, graphics uh, package. Rolling horizontally? Uh, no, she just rolls vertical. Yeah, right. Horizontal roll. Yeah. Uh, no, if you said vertical, I, there, some of the Barcos, I've had that problem too, vertical, I'll lose. We're, the Barco sometimes rides on the hairy edge of the raster scan, and you'll, you'll see it because you'll get clipping on the left side. Mm -hmm. But I have never seen the. Uh, I mean, she just rolls and I've rolls. I've never seen a roll. horizontal roll. No, that's huh? that's more electronics than the Barco. It, it is. In yeah. other words, that there's. Uh, you can, if you see the problem, you, you'll see it as, as a vertical as a uh, vertical problem, and you'll see clipping on the left side. Uh huh. Horizontal. And, and that's, so that's, just the, uh, that's just the monitor itself, and not uh, nothing to do with the software. No. Okay. Thank you. This is the end of this cassette. Please advance the tape as far as possible for the next playing.